This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you very much. What a great honor to receive this President's Medal and the distinguished company that you have just mentioned. I'm very happy to be back here in Emory. As a student, I was not too far away from here. I was in Vanderbilt in Nashville. And occasionally, I would come in here in Emory campus because I had some friends here. So my connection with Emory goes way back. It's a thrilling experience for me to come back to Atlanta, a city with so much history that I was very closely associated with because I came at a time when the civil rights movement was at the peak. And there I saw the role Atlanta played and all the leaders, Dr. Martin Luther King and everybody. So I'm thrilled to come back to that city. And I'm very happy that, uh, as uh, Gary Hawk has mentioned, that the friendship that is growing over the past few months because we are involved in something which you feel that uh, Emory could help us and find a way to solve the problems that we have, healthcare. And we got involved in many diverse areas of healthcare, trying to bring healthcare to the poorest people in an affordable way. And we look forward to, to this friendship to grow over time. And as I was being introduced about my work, lots of generous words were used. And that's what happens when you become good friends. You use a little bit exaggerated words. <laughs> that's a sign of friendship. But what I did really was something very commonplace, was not unusual at all. Only in one way I would say it is unusual, and that became kind of a signature of my work. I always get involved with something which I don't know anything about. <laughs> and it never bothered me doing that. And that's one reason why, how I got involved with banking. I have no background in banking. I don't know anything about banking. Uh, but I bumped into it anyway. And I never had any guilty feeling about it. Even uh, reflecting on it, probably, I would say that was the best thing that I did because I didn't know anything about banking. If I knew it, probably I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> that is the blessing of not knowing something. You can do anything you want. And I did. And it worked. I was not trying to do any banking or anything of that sort. I was just in lots of trouble in the country and I got caught up in that endless problems. I was here doing my teaching in the Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, enjoying my work. Then Bangladesh gets into trouble, civil war, uh, it's a liberation war. Lots of people got killed, lots of devastations. And I was trying to build up support for independence of Bangladesh, trying to address the people in the United States and the members of the Congress, the government of the United States, change their policy and recognize Bangladesh as an independent country. As soon as Bangladesh became independent, I resigned from my job and got back to Bangladesh right away. So it was a totally devastated country, but at the same time feel very excited that now we have a country that we can build it in our own, in the images of our dreams. Sometimes your dreams turn into nightmares. 
And that's what happened in the case of Bangladesh because we quickly ran into terrible economic situation, famine. And here I'm teaching economics in one of the universities there, here the famine raging in the country. Out of desperation, when you are desperate, you do anything. So out of desperation, I thought I must do something and do something that I can handle. So I started going to the village next door to the university campus, trying to see if I can be of any use to anybody in that village, even for a day. I thought at least I'll feel a little bit better that I'm doing something to be useful. And that was the beginning. And it led me to other kind of things. Started discovering the loan sharking in the village, tiny loans given to the poor people. And in the process, they take the whole control of their life, everything taken over by the loan sharks. Seeing it in very concrete ways, I became more and more curious. How does it happen? Why people do that? So I wanted to know more about it. So as a curious person, I wanted to make a list of people who is borrowing from whom, how much money they borrowed, what was the reason. And my, when my list was complete, there were 42 names on the list. The total amount they borrowed was $27. And I couldn't believe that people have to suffer so much for so little. And I was totally shocked. Then suddenly it came to my mind that the problem is very difficult. But the solution is so simple. And I immediately took that solution. I took the money from my pocket. I gave this money according to the list and asked them to return the money to the loan sharks. And my, idea, my idea was that if they return the money, loan sharks cannot bother them anymore, cannot touch them anymore, and they will be free. All it needed was $27. I did that. I thought this is one of the many other things that I did. But I didn't realize that it will grow so big. But seeing the reaction among the people in the village, it led me to another direction. They were so excited that something like this can happen. Then I asked myself, if you can make so many people so happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? So I wanted to do more of it. The next idea came, why don't I connect these poor people in the village with the bank which is located in the campus? I know these people. So I went to the bank. I thought, it's just a simple thing. and such a logical thing. They will take it. See how innocent I was about banking? <laughs> the bank manager said, no way. <laughs> bank doesn't lend money to the poor people. I said, why not? Because they are not credit worthy. I said, how do you know? He said, everybody knows they are not credit worthy. I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it went on. It, it uh, has no solution. He will not give up and I won't give in. So the confrontation became more and more terse. He suggested, I can't do anything. You better go up above the ladder, talk to my senior people in the banking. Maybe they will find a way. I can't give anything to you. So from then on, I just go on talk, knocking at everybody's door, trying to explain. Everybody gives me the same answer. It cannot be done. It went on for months. Finally, I learned something about banking and used it. I said, why didn't you take me as a guarantor? Because you said, if there is somebody who can guarantee, guarantee the loan, there is a provision in your rule that you can lend money. I said, take me as a guarantor. 
So this time I spoke their language. So they cannot just really throw me away from their office. <laughs> but they took their time studying me, studying my finance. Finally, after two months, they agreed. So that was the beginning. I was very excited that finally I can do this. And I took the money from the bank, signed every single paper, started giving the money. And the bank manager said, say goodbye to your money. <laughs> this money is never going to come back. Get ready to pay it back. I said, I have no idea whether it's going to work or not. I never did it before, but I'll try. So I tried. I came up with simple rules to make it easy for people to pay back. And it worked. And that's what happened after that. Just trying to expand it to the next village and the next village every time it works. Now when it grew bigger and bigger, people kept asking me, how did you design the system? You must have done lots of research doing that. I said, no, I'm an impatient man. I don't do research. <laughs> <laughs> I just go ahead and do it. <laughs> so I got, kept doing it. And for me, it became very easy, and it was lots of fun too, and easy and fun. All I have to do when I need a little process, little procedures, how to do it, I don't know anything about it. I just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. When I learn how they do it, all I have to do is to do the opposite. <laughs> very easy way. <laughs> Never fail. <laughs> Conventional banks could go to the rich because their principle is the more you have, the more you get. That's their principle. So they are always trying to find someone who has more and the most. I just reverse that principle. I go to the people who have little or nothing. And you have nothing, you have the highest priority. Very simple. And that's what we have been doing. Conventional banks in Bangladesh always reach out to men. More than 99% of their borrowers are men. We reversed it. We went to the women. Even today, when we have over 8 million borrowers in Bangladesh within Grameen Bank, 97% of them are women. See how reverse process works? Conventional banks want collateral. Without collateral, unless you have lots, they will not give you anything. That's how the whole system is built. We reversed it. We said no collateral. We are looking for people who has nothing. So, why worry about collateral? So we dismiss the whole idea of collateral. When you don't have collateral, then something else happens. You, didn't, you don't need any lawyers. <laughs> you need the lawyer so that you can keep the collateral for you. <laughs> now that you don't have collateral, you don't need lawyers. So we are a, we are a lawyer free bank. <laughs> And conventional banks are owned by rich people. You look around, it's the rich people who own the bank. We reversed it. We made the poor people own the bank. And the poor women own the bank. So borrowers of Grameen Bank are the owners of Grameen Bank. So individually they are very poor, but collectively they own this huge bank in Bangladesh. That's another one. So we go on, everything we do, just the other way. Conventional banks will ask lots of questions before they give you a loan about your past history, about your credit records, about your turn, whatever businesses you have made or whatever experience you've gathered. We made it simple. We said, forget about the past. 
We are not interested in the people's past. We are interested in the future of the people. So let's concentrate on the future. And poor people always have troubles. They may have some mistakes. They have some trouble in the past. Don't go on kind of digging it up and make their life more complicated. Just move on, wherever they are. Experience? What experience? They don't have any experience. Nobody gave an opportunity to have experience. So why talk about experience? Just move on from the point that she wants to take the next first step. That's what we do. So we can keep on adding items after items on that list. Conventional banks are not interested in the children of their clients. But we are very much. Grameen Bank is very much interested in the children of the borrowers of Grameen Bank. It almost became an obsession with us. We make it as a part of our service role, the condition of assignments of our staff, to make sure the children of the families that they work for must be in school. Remember this women that I'm talking about, they are totally illiterate. Never went to school, never can write, their, write or read or anything. Their husbands don't read and write. It's a repetition of the same history, years after years, generation after generations, which is repeated. And illiteracy continued with them. So we thought this is our opportunity to make a break in that. So the second generation in Grameen families would be different. They'll be educated, all of them. Not a single person should be missed. And as a result, we could achieve that goal, having all the children of Grameen families in school. And we take a lot of pride when students come up with brilliant results in schools. It's an amazing kind of experience. It's a thrilling experience to see a little kid coming from a totally illiterate family, going for the first time in history of that family, going to school. And you expect that child will be sitting in the back. You expect that child will be not speaking at all, not participate in the class activities. But the reality is so different. You see this little kid coming out the top of the class. It's an amazing kind of experience. It kind of gives you goosebumps seeing these kids, not every one of them, but some of them, the top of the class. So we thought we should celebrate that, the fact that something like that can happen. We introduce scholarships to celebrate that take these little kids in front of the whole village, give them scholarships, real cash for the family, for the child, because of the performance he or she has made. And the family feels absolutely thrilled. Something like that can happen to that family. And then I, we thought we can take these children, we're hoping, we're praying that these children somehow complete their primary education don't drop out, don't get lost. But again, reality was more strange than we thought. They did get through the primary education, but didn't stop there. They continued, continued to the high school. And then first time we see some of the kids are coming to the colleges. But the college is a difficult place, you need money, expenses. Parents don't have that. So immediately we sat down and came up with an idea, education loan. Give them education loan. So we started giving education loans so that money doesn't stop them from going to higher education. They came all the way. So now we have students coming to higher education, some of them becoming engineers, doctors, professionals some of them completing their PhD. In this trip, 
while I'm in the USA, I was visiting one university campus. After I spoke, someone came out. He said, he said I want to introduce myself, so go ahead. I said, I'm from Bangladesh, and I'm a, my mother is a borrower of Grameen Bank. I came, I'm studying here for my PhD. So I was, again, this is a great moment for me that uh, not only there, now I say here, they're coming into universities studying here. Right now, there are more than 50,000 students on education loans in medical schools, engineering schools, universities, everywhere. And one of the issues that we're discussing with Emory to create nursing colleges so that we can take the young girls who are getting educated now from the families of Grameen Bank, which is a poor family by definition, take them into nursing colleges, Grameen Bank give them education loans, and they become world-class nurses, become professional persons. Not only she transforms herself, it transforms her family, it transforms the whole village, because a girl from the village becoming a nurse working around the world, it's possible. And there are hundreds of thousands and millions of these young girls who can become professional people. All they need is opportunity. So I thought nursing college would be a good opportunity to produce a large number of them. Not only you're doing the healthcare, a service to the healthcare, but also transforming the whole community of young girls in Bangladesh. Now, as I go from villages to villages, when I meet people trying to kind of get the reality check, what's happening, one thing is numbers, one thing is real people. As I go around, I meet this woman who has joined Grameen Bank 10 years back, 15 years back, 20 years back. And I see her daughter along with her. And this young girl looks exactly like her mother. And I think she must be helping her mother in her business now that she has expanded her business. When I ask her, what did you do? What are you doing now? She said, I'm a medical doctor. I practice in the neighboring town. I heard that you're visiting our village, so I came to see you. I never met you before. So I'm very happy to see her, very happy to see her mother. And in a situation like that, always a thought flashes through my mind. Her mother could have been a doctor too. There's nothing wrong with her mother. But her mother remained illiterate all her life. Not because she has seen something lacking in her, but something society never gave her an opportunity to go to school to learn her alphabets. Now one tiny little thing happened in that family's life. The mother could join in a group of other women to take loans from Grameen Bank. And she changed her life and she sent her daughter to school. She got education loan, she became a medical doctor. So you always come up with the question again and again, what creates poverty? Is poverty is in the person? Or poverty is something is imposed from outside on the person? Then seeing the reality of life as you see every day, you are totally convinced that poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we have built, by the institutions that we have created, and maintain those institutions, sing the glory of those institutions. The policies that we pursue, concepts that we have designed, 
and we universities play a very important role in it. That's what created poverty. So it is in externally imposed on the person. So if you accept that proposition, that means if we change our system, the institutions, the concepts, the policies, nobody will be a poor person. But the seed of poverty could be extracted from those places and it will not be transferred to the people. And people will be completely normal human being. Each human being is packed with unlimited potential, no matter where he or she lives. This is part of being a human being. The enormous amount of creativity, enormous amount of ingenuity that each person has is packed into the person. But the unfortunate fact is, society doesn't give the opportunity to even to know that she has the gift it's a wonderful gift that she is carrying with her. Let alone have the opportunity to unwrap that gift, find out what I got. And that's what keeps her the way she is, because she doesn't know. She accepts it, what everybody else tells her. So in the process, the entire mankind is deprived of all the creativity and energy and the ingenuity that is lost by not being able to unleash that. When we talk about microcredit, when we talk about Grameen Bank, we talk about tiny loans. And that tiny loans, if you wonder how this tiny loan can change a person, what, what is there? It's not the amount of loan. It is, that loan becomes a kind of a tool, an instrument, to make the opening of that gift. And the women themselves get surprised that, oh, I can do that. I can earn money. I have the capacity. Everybody thought, everybody told me that you are nothing. You don't know anything. I know something. I earned a dollar today because I made the work, make it work. And that excites her. She wants to do this next thing. She starts planning. Her mind just starts working. So far, her mind didn't work because it was not necessary her mind to work. Suddenly, you hear that sound, ticking sound in your mind because now you're calculating. What do you do next? What do you do next? And that's the important thing. That is the, I think that's the magic of what microcredit does. Make you feel that you are important. You can take responsibility of your own life. You can be in the driving, driver's seat of your life. You are not at the mercy of other people. Today, after 34 years of Grameen Bank, we have, as I said, 8 million, or more than 8 million borrowers, mostly women, 97% women. We lend out over $100 million a month in tiny amounts. After all these years, still it's tiny amount. Tiny amount averaging less than $200. But what a transformation it makes in them. The bank is owned by them. And bank never takes money from outside. So whenever you hear about microcredit, sometimes you immediately conclude, OK, banks give tiny loans to the poor people. That's microcredit. And I hope now you realize what microcredit is, because that's why I was saying we do everything the opposite way. It's not just the same bank giving tiny loan. That doesn't make it microcredit. It can look like microcredit, but it is not microcredit. Because microcredit means an entire different system. Within that system, you build yourself up. The whole, whole system is dedicated to build her up and build her second generation up. And we don't need money from outside. Somehow, microcredit means, oh, I have to give some money to them. No, you don't have to give money to them. 
All this money we lend out over a billion dollar a year. We don't take any money from anybody. Not from the government, not from a bank, not from international agency. We don't need to. Because as a bank, we can remain self-reliant, self-sufficient anytime we want because all we do is take deposits, just like any other bank do. We take deposits and lend this money to the poor people in the place, in the area. And we have plenty of money because people keep their money in our, with our bank. So it's a self-reliant system. Today it has a spread in many countries almost every single country in the world. We even started running our own bank, bank-like, it's not bank because we don't have a banking license. In New York City, call it Grameen America. We were challenged that it don't work in this country because poverty is different here than in Bangladesh. I said, of course it's different. Our people are different. I said, no, that's not true. People are people, no matter what they are. So we took the challenge and said, let's do it. Let's figure it out. On the ground, that will be shown, rather than just debate on the, with the words. So we started two years back in Queens, New York, and it worked beautifully. We do exactly the way we do it in Bangladesh. And today, after two years, we have over 2,000 borrowers, in both in Queens and Brooklyn. All of them are women. Average loan in New York City, guess how much? $1,500. It's amazing to see what $1,500 mean to people. They take it so seriously, they work so hard, and they're so happy that they got this money to do something they couldn't do for years. A home cleaner, she used to work for a home house cleaning company, cleaning company. She, Bush, he lost her job but 15 years back. So she was telling me that I thought, what can I do with myself without a job? So I waited and waited, then finally thought, why don't I do it myself? I know friends, I'll tell her, I'll clean your house and give me some money. So I've been doing this for this 15 or 13 years. And then I get this loan from Grameen program. For the first time in my life, I have a carpet cleaning machine. All this time, all these years, I'm cleaning it by my hand. Now I don't have to use my hand. To her, it's such an important thing. So now we just opened another branch in Omaha, Nebraska, and doing exactly the same thing. We are now invited in San Francisco to do the same thing. The point I'm making, the need is everywhere. In this country, which you can imagine the most sophisticated banking system in the world, but you have payday loans everywhere. That doesn't tell a good story about banking system. You open a newspaper, you open any magazine, you have advertisement for payday loans. We started working against the loan sharks. Now, loan sharks advertise their business. We have no solution to that because nobody's interested. Interest rate in a payday loan would be 50%, 500%, 1,000%. <laughs> it goes on. Pawn shops, check cashing companies. So it, the point I was making that it is the institutions which help, which push people in one direction. If we had redesigned that institutions so that everybody has access to that service, the world would be different. 34 years back, the bank manager in 
the campus of the university that I was teaching, he told me poor are not credit worthy. That's why they don't lend money to the poor people. And along the way I saw real situation is different. I am asking question, should the banks tell that poor people are not credit worthy? Or should the people tell them that they are not people worthy? <laughs> it's just a coincidence that we started the program in uh, Jackson Heights in Queens in 2008, January. Uh, we didn't plan it that way, but it happened that way. And that's the year when financial crisis came. By the time financial crisis came, when the big banks were shaking, chic big banks are collapsing, this program in New York City is flourishing. No collateral, nothing. So who is the creditworthy person? But it's still conventional banks remain conventional banks. They don't open their door. I said financial crisis is an excellent opportunity excellent opportunity to redesign things so that we don't repeat the same things we have been doing over and over again and creating these problems. Why don't you go and redesign it? So that the banking system becomes an inclusive system. So nobody is denied from that. In Grameen Bank, we lend money to the beggars. We have more than 100,000 beggars in our program. Very simple idea. We tell them that as you go from house to house begging, would you carry some merchandise with you? Some cookies, some candies, some toys for the kids? It's not an art shattering idea. We tell them, look, you are going there anyway. It's not extra work for you. <laughs> <laughs> and they realize that, yes, it's no extra work. We go there anyway. So we said, we give you the money to buy all the stuff that people like, would like to buy from you. So you give people options whether they would like to buy something from you or they would like to give some charity, some food, some money so that you can have something to eat. It's up to them to decide. They may do both. That's okay. So you are in the winning side anyway. They liked it. In the beginning, I thought maybe there'll be 2,000, 3,000 beggars and we'll see how they do. It became such a popular program. <laughs> By now, it is a four-year-old program. By now, more than 18,000 beggars have stopped begging completely. <laughs> and remaining 90,000 or so, I would say they are part-time beggars. <laughs> sometimes begging, sometimes selling. They're very smart too. They will tell you right away which house is good for begging <laughs> and which house is good for selling. When I first learned about it, I was so amused. I told my colleagues, see, they've never been to business schools. But they understood the market segmentation. <laughs> so why can't we create a system which is open to everybody? Can you now say that poor people are not credit worthy? No way. They are the better, most credit worthy people you'll see on this planet. Because all over the world. And the concept, I said, the fault that we have created, the, the flaws that we have on our system, one flaw is in the concept of business. And I have been shouting about it all the time, that we have to redesign that concept. There's only one concept of business business to make money. And they make it more clear, they state it more clearly. Profit maximization is the mission of business. All we have to do is to make money. That's what we, we came to this planet for, make money. Doesn't make sound, doesn't sound right at all. Human beings are not one dimensional being. We are not money making machines. We are not robots, but the theory has made it so. Because some theoreticians said 
All you do in business is make money. So we are making money. Our success are measured by how much money we made. Is this what the success of a human life? How much money I made? Or how much contribution I made to the world? I don't know. You have to figure it out. But to me, this one doesn't look right. That all we do in our life is make money. Making money is a means and making money is an end. It doesn't make sense. What do I do when I go? Leave this money behind? Didn't do anything with it. So I'm saying that is a wrong interpretation of a human being in the whole theory of economics. Human being is much bigger being, multidimensional being. You have to treat the whole human being within that theory. Theory is not something to make me fit into the theory. Theory should fit into me, other way, but not the one that we have. We are trying to fit into the theory. We are, as a human being, we are selfish. Of course we are selfish, because that came from our self-protection. We want to protect ourselves, and that's the selfishness all about. But as a human being, at the same time, we are selfless. That selfless part is not entertained within economics. Why? Why can't we have the whole human being together? So I'm suggesting, why don't we build businesses on the basis of selflessness? In the selfish business, everything is for me, nothing for others. In the selfless business, everything for others, nothing for me. It's by decision, not that somebody forced me. I don't want to take money from this because I want to change the world with this business. And I can do that. When I talk about it, people say, ah, no, no, it's not right. People want something. Why should they be in business if they're not making money? I said, you think that way because that's how you are told. That's how your mind is made. You grew up with this idea. Now you cannot see anything else. Our eyes now wearing the profit maximizing glasses all the time. We see the world with profit maximizing glass. We cannot think any other kind of world. I said, why don't you take off that glasses for a while and put on that selfless business glasses and see the world is completely different. And I'm calling this selfless business a social business. And then I started creating those business myself so that people, I can demonstrate. I thought demonstration gives a better understanding of the idea than just talking about it. And people start looking at it. Particularly when it, we did a joint venture with a giant company called Danone, which is a milk product company, French company. So we created a joint venture company, social business company, Grameen Danone food company in Bangladesh. What we do in this social business, we produce yogurt for a very specific reason, because social business has to address a social problem so that it can be eliminated. So we designed this social business to eliminate the malnutrition among the children of Bangladesh. Bangladeshi children has a very high level of malnutrition. Mo nearly 50% or half the children of Bangladesh are malnourished. Most of them are severely malnourished. So their life starts with a very poor health and get worse as they grow up. What we're doing, we create yogurt, put all the micronutrients which are missing in the children, put it in the yogurt, and make it very cheap so that even the poorest child can afford it. And it's a very delicious yogurt. And that's what the contribution of Danone. Because if we had made this yogurt and put all those micronutrients, this will be terrible medicine kind of thing. <laughs> but they, they have hidden the taste of medicine completely. Children love it. Now we, have the, we created the first plant about three years back. Now we have over the full production of that uh, plant and children are eating, and we have gained Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. This is an international research institution based in Geneva. 
we invited them to monitor the health impact of this yogurt on the children of Bangladesh, what they're eating, so that they can, they can tell us that whether it's really happening or not. After all, if it is not happening, that's not a social business. Social business has to have impact. And in, because it's a social business, both Danone and Grameen agreed they will never take any profit out of this company because nothing for us, everything is for others. We can take back our investment money, nothing beyond that. And that becomes a social business. If this yogurt company was a profit-making company, we'll be asking the CEO of this company at the end of the year, how much money we have made this year? Why can't we make more money out of this company? What are you doing next year? But since Grameen Danone is a social business, we ask our CEO at the end of the year, how many children got out of malnutrition this year? Because that is the objective of the company. And what are we doing to make sure more children get out of malnutrition next year? This is the question we'll be asking CEO. And the CEO will be working throughout the year to achieve those goals. But maintaining that it recovers his cost. If you lose money, it's not a business. So you cannot lose money. So it's a non-loss, non-dividend company with a social object. If we now repeat this company again and again throughout Bangladesh, and really if the yogurt helps overcome the malnutrition, all these children will become a healthy children. We can solve it. Then came water. Another company, Veolia, a big water company in the world, maybe the largest water company in the world, a French company. They came to us that we would like to do a social business. We like your idea. So we created Grameen Veolia Water Company to bring very clean water in the villages. Water is a problem everywhere. And our problem is very unique. We have arsenic problem with very high level of arsenic in our water. 45 million people of Bangladesh, which is one, almost one third of the population of Bangladesh, drink poison every day. Their children drink poison every day, arsenic. Very high contamination. No solution. So we said, we will bring the solution. We'll create a company as a social business and bring the water, you pay, and company recovers the cost, and you take it from there. So now that company is operating in Bangladesh, and you're very happy with it. Another company came, BASF, is a large chemical company, German company, want to do social business. We discussed, and we have two so social business, one for producing micronutrients in sachet so that uh, many of our women are malnourished at the same time, a lot of uh, iron deficiency. So try to overcome these problems with this 15 micronutrients sachet. So this would be one social business. Another one, producing mosquito nets, impregnated mosquito nets against malaria and dengue so that mosquitoes cannot bite you. Make it very cheap. As a social business, all you want to do is to cover your cost. You are not worried about making tons of money and come up with ideas how to make cheaper for, for poor people and make a little money for the rich people so that you can make the poor people's mosquito net still cheap. So this is what we're doing. Another company, I'll just stop listing all these companies <laughs> because it's interesting, each one of them. They invited me to come to their headquarters, talk to their staff and colleagues as I was visiting Germany. So I went there. This is Adidas, the sportswear company, shoe company. And I met the CEO and he said, we are very interested in your concept. You'd like to do something, social business. What should we do? I said, I have no crazy idea, but we can discuss about it. He said, why don't you start with a statement of commitment? He said, like what? I said, maybe something like this. Nobody in the world should go without shoes. As a shoe company, it's our responsibility to produce shoes affordable to even the poorest person. He looks at me, he said, that's a tall order. <laughs> I said, you can take it because you're Aditas. <laughs> I said, can, we, can I discuss it with my colleagues because I alone cannot make this decision. This is a big one. I said, you take your time. So, 
So he sent me around to see in a guided tour all the facilities, all the museums of sports and history of the company and so on. And then during the lunchtime we gather again with his colleagues and him. He sits, sits next to me, he said, my colleagues have asked me one question so that I can raise it with you. How cheap should it be <laughs> to make it affordable to the poorest person? I said, I have no idea, but why don't you make it, say, under one dollar? <laughs> he says, you are a very difficult man. <laughs> I said, no, I'm trying to tell you what it sh should work. So they took it very seriously. Ever since they are working, they are sending their engineers, their designers, their market people in Bangladesh, talk to the women, in, poor women in villages of Bangladesh, their children, their husbands what kind of shoe, shoe they would like, what kind of price they would like to pay, how much they paid for the shoes they have ever bought, etc., etc. And they have designed it after six months of this research and running around. And now, next month, they will bring 10,000 pairs of this, these shoes to, for test marketing to get the reaction from the people who would like to wear it and so on. And after they get the reaction, they will redesign again and put it in and then set up a plant to produce this. Shoes here, as I'm talking, is not for fashion. It's not for comfort. This is a vital healthcare intervention because many of our diseases attack us to the skin of our feet. You'll see bloated stomach of children. You see this in the newspaper or television worms, hookworms particularly, kills children because they penetrate into your body. And adults too. M much of our malnutrition comes from the disease of parasitic diseases. So if you have a shoes, if you have shoes wearing, they cannot enter your body. So you protect yourself, your children, your family, from these parasitic diseases. And this is one, you, at least one disease you have taken care of by doing that. So you can create lots of these social businesses. Now people ask me here, what kind of social business can we do here? We have nothing. I said, you have a lot of things. Anything which bothers you can be designed as a social business. Right away. So like what? I said, look at this welfare. If I can create a business, a social business, to take, say, five people out of welfare, that would be a wonderful thing. You created a business to take five people out of welfare. In the process, what you have done, you have created a seed, a miracle seed. Now this seed can be planted over and over again. Each time you plant, five people get out of welfare. And then 10 people will get out of welfare, 10 million people will get out of welfare. Very simple. Because you plan, you design that seed. In the process, it will be improved, it will be redesigned, refined, and so on. Make it more easy. Unemployment. I said, if you want to do this, you can address the issue of unemployment. You can design a beautiful social business to help five people get out of unemployment. How? Or oh, you can start, as, say, just for the sake of it, a grocery store, a corner grocery store. We'll do that where five people can work. But why don't the money makers do that? They are not setting up a grocery store here because money makers will put this investment in grocery store here if they are assured that the minimum return on their investment will be 15 25% and above. Only then they will come. If they do not, get, do not have guarantee or do not have expectation, they will have that kind of return on their investment, they will not be interested because they will put their money someplace else. But as a social business person, you are not interested in the return on your investment. You are interested in solving the problem of five unemployed people. Your objective is different. So you create it. If you get 1% return on your investment, that money stays with the company. You don't take it. You, you are never taking any dividend out of this company. You are very happy that you created five jobs for these people. 
And in the process, again, you created a seed. So each social business is a seed. Anybody can do that. A young person can do that. A retired person can do that. A business executive can do that. It's a street person can do that. It's a question of exercising your mind. And then you solve the problem. Problem of unemployment, problem of drug addiction, problem of suicide, problem, whatever. I said, Are you, can you do everything? I said, I don't know. But if you put our mind into it, somebody will come up with a great idea. It's a question of using the ideas, that's all. We have enormous technology in the world. You are amazed by the way, the fast growth of that technology. Every day, every moment it's growing, that technology. What use do we make our technology? All this fantastic power that we create every moment, we use it for making money. If we could use this same technology, that's which is continually expanding technology, to solve the problem of unemployment, solve the problem of diseases, solve the problem of environment in a social business way, these problems will simply disappear. But we don't do that because we are told only thing you do is make money. So we have to go back, re-engineer the design of the architecture, which says people do only this. We say no, this will be a world of two businesses, two kinds of businesses. Business of making money, at the same, same time, social business, business of changing the world, removing all the problems that we made already, created all the problems that we have, we will remove them. Once we redesign these concepts and policies and the institutions, nobody has to be a poor person, nobody has to be a sick person, because it is not part of a human being. So we bring the real human being out and then let him and let her unleash herself and himself, see what happens to the world. It will be a very different kind of world. It's all up to us to decide. We don't have to wait for the theoreticians to write in the textbook there are two kinds of businesses. If I decide there are two kinds of business, that's enough for me. <laughs> and I'll do both. Nobody can stop me. It's my decision. And all of us can do that. And we can create things ourselves. Within the university, we can create groups. Some of them call themselves Grameen Creative Labs. Many universities have created Grameen Creative Labs. Just put together exercise, design, put them on the website. This is a beautiful design of a social business. You're saying that once you can design it, somebody will invest in it. That's it. And we are even creating, uh, talking about creating social business funds. So that anybody has a great idea, here is an investment. Not for making money, to make it happen. Show us. If it happens, then we have discovered something. And there are many initiatives in creating social business funds. And we are talking about creating social stock market so that I can buy a share of a social business, invest my money into it. It's possible. So we have to expand our ideas that we are at the center of solving the problems. Not we are just dumping all the problems on the shoulder of the government, say you solve it, we are busy making money, we don't have no time. That's no solution. If we get involved, it will get solved. In the process, we can create a new world where nobody will be a poor person. There's no need to. Then at that time I say, why don't we create poverty museums? <laughs> because there's no poverty in the world. And children will be asking, what is this poverty you talk about? <laughs> then we'll take them on Sunday to see the poverty museum. <laughs> this is what this used to be. And they will be shocked. And they will promise to themselves, they will never let them come again, come back again. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.